purpose of this video is to focus on the topic of climate change. In the last video we looked at the carbon cycle and climate change and carbon cycle has a lot to do with one another because one of the parts of a carbon cycle is the release of CO2 um, uh, through uh, release of carbon through CO2 into the atmosphere and CO2 carbon dioxide is a, is a type of greenhouse gas that actually can affect the uh, can affect the climate quite a bit. And so in this video, we'll take a closer look at how um, CO2 and other greenhouse gases can affect climate um, on, on our planet. And we'll also look at some of the different examples of what effect that's having currently and how we know it's actually happening uh, on the planet. Currently, about 0.038% um, about uh, by volume of the atmosphere is made up of carbon dioxide or you could also say that it's uh, about 380 to 390 parts per million. Um, most recently, that number has actually gone over 400 um, parts per million, and there's various stations throughout, um, throughout the world that measure the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and one of the most prominent is in Mauna Loa uh, on the Big Island in Hawaii. And so by taking measurements of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we can see how it's changed over time. Um, in the release of carbon dioxide through the process of photosynthesis, carbon dioxide gets released out into the atmosphere. That is one natural way that carbon dioxide is found in the atmosphere, in addition to other greenhouse gases. Probably one of the biggest issues is the amount of greenhouse gases, uh, one of those being carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, has increased uh, quite a bit in the last, um, particularly in the last few decades. What this is results in is something called the greenhouse effect. And this is actually a natural process. It's necessary in order for Earth to be able to stay warm. If this uh, greenhouse effect didn't occur, um, our planet would be very cold and life as we know it wouldn't be able to survive. And so what's happening in this situation is much like a plant greenhouse that you've maybe been inside, um, oftentimes very warm inside of it, kind of the same idea here. The atmosphere that surrounds the Earth helps to actually trap some of the sunlight from the sun and in doing so, that, that, that warmth bounces back to Earth and helps to create a uh, stabilized and warm temperature around the Earth. Um, and so the sunlight is warming up the sea and the land. Uh, some of that light uh, gets radiated back towards space, so some of it actually leaves. Um, and then a lot of that heat actually gets trapped here. Other greenhouse gases that help to trap uh, the, the, the sunlight warmth Within our atmosphere would include carbon dioxide, as previously mentioned, water vapor, uh, methane, um, some other pollutants such as nitrous oxide, and chlorofluorocarbons um, from our aerosol cans would be some examples of, of greenhouse gases uh, that, that trap this heat. Um, the two that are most impactful in retaining heat would be carbon dioxide and water vapor. Uh, others would be methane and nitrous oxides. Impacts. Um, dependent on gas ability to absorb long wave radiation, and we'll talk about that more in here in a second, and atmospheric concentration. So the greenhouse gases absorbs long wave radiation at different rates. Concentration of gas in the atmosphere also uh, can influence uh, the absorption and how much of that heat is actually retained. So we previously said carbon dioxide often released through photosynthesis, but it can also be released out into the atmosphere by combustion and respiration. Um, methane is emitted from marshes and waterlogged habits, uh, habitats excuse me, and landfills. Nitrous oxide oftentimes released by bacteria and agricultural and vehicle exhaust. Um, and all of these impact, um, their impact, the amount or the concentration depends on the rate at which it's released and how long it remains there. So some of these actually remain in the atmosphere longer than others. And so in looking at the difference between different types of, of radiation that comes from the sun, um, the solar radiation is about 400 nanometers in length. And what gets re-emitted from the Earth back out into space is a wavelength of about 10,000 nanometers, so quite a bit bigger or longer. So 25 to 35 uh, percent of short wave radiation, wavelength radiation from the sun is absorbed in the atmosphere before it reaches the Earth's surface as ultraviolet light. 70 to 75 percent of short wave radiation is absorbed on the Earth's surface here and converted to heat. The long wave radiation um, is reabsorbed by greenhouse gases as it's emitted back out from the Earth and helps to further retain heat. 
and about 70 to 80 percent is recaptured. And each greenhouse gas absorbs different specific wave bands. And so as there's more and more or a higher concentration of uh, greenhouse ga gases within the atmosphere, that percent of long wave radiation um, that, that is absorbed is increasing. So you might be thinking, well, how do we know this? Uh, what is the data for this? Uh, you probably heard previously about climate change or global warming and maybe thinking, uh, hopefully as a good scientist, how do we know this? What is the data for this? Um, what proof backs this up? And so one of the ways, as I previously mentioned, that we can measure the amount of CO2 is just taking samples currently in the atmosphere. But we're also able to uh, know how much CO2 was in the atmosphere previously, as well as temperatures on the planet. And this is actually pretty cool how we we're able to do this. Um, in different locations, primarily in the Arctic, um, they're able, scientists are able to make ice cores or drill for ice cores. And essentially what they're doing is extracting a core of ice like this, but that is really, really long. And by going down further into the ice, uh, you're essentially going back in time because that ice continually builds up over time. And so further down in this ice core as you go down um, you know, in depth, we're going back and back in time. And within that ice core, uh, there are bubbles of air that are trapped in the ice. And those can be extracted and analyzed to find uh, the amount of carbon dioxide concentration, as well as temperatures uh, can be deduced from ratios of hydro hydrogen isotopes in the water molecules. And so this allows us to determine the, the CO2 concentration as well as temperature going back hundreds of thousands of years. And we actually can go back uh, about 400,000 years from some of these different uh, ice cores. And so these are different locations that these cores are actually able to be. So these are different locations of where these different ice cores have been collected from. And you can see there's quite a bit of, of different locations. And from this, we're able to really look at and go back in history and examine what the CO2 and temperature levels looked like. And so by doing so, um, we've been able to examine and to compare uh, carbon dioxide, methane levels um, going back thousands of years. And so these two graphs here are showing the plot over time. Um, thousands of years before 1950 of how the different levels of carbon dioxide have changed over time. And you can see that there's an up and a down and it's not a continual um, level but they, they've changed over time both for carbon dioxide and for methane. In this second graph here the global average temperature um, measured over land and oceans uh, is examined uh, in comparison uh, to carbon dioxide. So the red bars indicate temperatures above and the blue bars uh, temperatures below the 1901 to 2000 average. And the black line shows the amount of atmospheric uh, carbon dioxide. And so you can see uh, approaching the year 2000, about 1980, the number of years um, or the, the average temperature for that year, uh, the red bars again are indicating temperatures above the average. As so you can see, within the last 20 years or so, um, 30 years, we've been far above the average temperatures between 1901 and 2000. In this second graph here, we're looking at just in the last couple hundred years, and we can see the sea level deviation in millimeters in comparison to the year. And really what this is looking at is the average uh, global sea level, and it's also something that's closely associated with climate change um, because as temperatures continue to increase, uh, as they are expected to do so, more water in the oceans is going to really affect uh, cities that are, are close to um, uh, the ocean or to major river systems. Um, and so the, the sea level uh, since 1870 is in the red dots, the blue is the tidal gauge, and the, um, the black is uh, satellite observations, um, so a little bit more recently. And so we can see that over the last couple hundred years, uh, the sea level deviation it, it changes. Um, it does go up and down, but overall it has increased, um, especially with in the last uh, 50 to 60 years or so. And so really what all this is showing us is that there's a correlation between carbon dioxide and temperature. As the amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere increase, temperature on Earth has also increased. Uh, although temperature is not directly proportional to greenhouse gas concentrations, there is 
uh, does seem to be a connection. Increases in gas concentrations tend to cause a higher global average temperatures. Not all areas are necessarily going to be warmer, but overall, for the average for the entire planet, temperatures do seem to be, to be increasing and getting warmer. Uh, higher temperature, again, is going to have some major effects. Uh, increased evaporation from the oceans. Higher ocean temperatures increases severity and frequency of storms. We've seen that uh, really recently within the last couple of years. Um, the various hurricanes that have affected the East Coast. Um, uh, New Orleans a number of years ago, uh, most recently just in this last couple of weeks, North Carolina is receiving uh, crazy amounts of rain. Um, these are just two of the effects, um, and there will continue to be many others. Uh, the general trend of fluctuation in atmospheric carbon dioxide um, overall is dropped as low as 188 part per million, um, with warm periods as high as 300. Never before, in going back and looking at all of that data from the different ice cores that we've been able to extract and examine, never before has the, the carbon dioxide levels surpassed 400 parts per million until now. Um, and, and so really when all of this started was uh, in the 18th century during the Industrial Revolution, there was a dramatic increase in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And so here's looking at carbon dioxide, and this is going back uh, about 400,000 years ago. You can see there's up and downs, up and downs, up and downs. And part of that natural cycle is to go down and come back up. But you can see here within the last few years, most recently, the levels have increased and far surpassed anything that we've ever measured before, um, which is, is concerning um, for, for an environmental impact standpoint. Um, and so this will have some, some major effects on different Arctic systems. Um, ice deserts, low-lying tree lands with little vegetation and no trees, little soil, most things are frozen in these ecosystems, in these Arctic ecosystems, and most of the nutrients are frozen and released during shorter, warmer, warmer and growing periods. So that's generally what the ecosystem is like. What we expect to see happen in these types of ecosystems would be a loss of ice habitats, which we've already started to see, increased flooding, decay of microorganisms leading to the release of additional methane and CO2, appearance of conifers and other um, organisms that would radiate heat and, heat and actually increase warming, arrival of insect-eating species, uh, wider flora, and arrival of small mammals and predators, and an increased presence of pathogen. And you might be thinking, well, some of those things really aren't that bad. You know, a wider variety of organisms, um, more trees, more plants, more animals. But really, it's going to eliminate or could eliminate the, this Arctic ecosystem, which has a wide diversity of, of organisms that live in this type of ecosystem as it is. And um, with that, Probably one of the, the greatest threats is the uh, changing of uh, uh, st storm patterns and severity of storm patterns as well as the amount of uh, water in the ocean and the ocean levels. We'll continue to look at this in class and examine some of the data a little bit further and look at some of the impacts further as well.